Computer science, software really, a friend writes, is about creation. You start with nothing and you create something that has a certain level of intelligence and is able to perform certain functions according to what has been designed by the Creator. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he filled creation with all kinds of matter, elemental building blocks that operate on hard-coded programming and principles, physical principles, a vast array of vegetation that seems to take on a different kind of life, a more kind of life than those elemental building blocks, a seed and plant kind of eco-intelligence. And then animals God made in the creation account with an even greater creaturely capacity. And then finally, the ultimate creation of God, human beings, people like you were made by God. The pinnacle of His design and arguably the greatest expression of his creatorly mind. You are, by being a human being, the embodiment of the intelligence of God. That's who God says you are. With incredible capacities to contemplate and to stand outside of yourself and to think objectively and to imagine and cognitively process and create and co-create with God and sub-create before Him. God made you a little lower than God, the poet writes, and crowned you with glory and honor. So two months ago, I'm speaking in Sacramento at another church, committing ecclesiastical adultery, And whenever you do that, you pull out an old sermon. Uh, So the one that I did here on an electrician in the God and Work series, I re-preached it there. And afterwards was talking to all these people, and this one software guy comes up to me and says, and this was a smart guy, you could tell. He says, yeah, everything you said there about electrician applies to what I do in these ways. And he basically started writing out a sermon on knowing God through So software engineering, and never one to avoid as much work as possible, I said, write it all down and send it to me because I think there's something there that that your job in a unique way points to, shows us that we can look through to see something unique about the person of God. And so he sent me a long note, and here are just a few excerpts from this programmer. He wrote, there is a progression of the level of intelligence required by a program and by the creator himself. First, the simplest of software creations has everything hard-coded, meaning that the programs themselves are filled with static and inflexible constants that never vary or change. This takes little intelligence. The next step is called object-oriented design. And in this case, the software is created in a manner that reflects real life. The creator imagines objects like customers and carts, example Amazon, or monsters, World of Warcraft, and he or she models these objects on their real life counterparts. The ultimate step for a creator would be to create something that is able to grow, change, evolve, develop new skills, new relationships, etc that were perhaps imagined by the Creator, but were not hard-coded into each object. You create something like a cat, which evolves into a leopard, or a lion, or a tiger, or a panther, or a cheetah, etc. And then later he asks this very good question. How much intelligence would a Creator need to have and embody and embody in order to create a world of objects that were able to evolve in ways like this? It would require infinitely more intelligence to create a world in this way than if everything was hard-coded. These ideas came to him as he was trying to process a God who might have used evolution to 
create the world. And then one last sentence. He says, nobody can do this in computer software today. We're, we are still at that level of creating discrete objects. To be able to create software that could do what God did, that's only the stuff of science fiction today. What strikes me in reading that email from him and the ensuing conversation that we had was that we as human beings are the only creatures that we know of that can create things with embedded intelligence that are intelligent enough to do something like that, like write software code that starts to approach the artificial intelligence level. And then it struck me that yeah, these programmers who live in these world-creating places are probably on the leading edge of humanity investing their intelligence into creating intelligence that continues. And then, of course, it strikes me, well, then what do they say about you, God, when they do what they do and love to do? Because in the image of you, God, they were created, and in the image of God, he created software designers. He created them with the desire to more fully image Him, and as they seek to embed more and more and more intelligence into the programs that they write and design. They are reaching for a glory that God wrote into them and coded into them to be like their maker who is a being who embeds intelligence in his creation. They're made to take joy in that process the way God takes joy in embedding intelligence into the world. When he does that, the poet again, the psalmist, may the glory of the Lord endure forever May the Lord rejoice in His works. God rejoices in the process of embedding intelligence in you so that you can go out and do what you do, building God's world. He delights in us doing that. Like I quoted once from Dorothy Sayers, an old Christian writer. It's like a screenwriter who writes a script... And then it gets to the stage and the actors fill the roles within the script and it comes alive and they bring their intelligence into the intelligence that's embedded into the screenplay and something more results. When I said that to the software guy, Chuck Black, he said back to me, yes, that is exactly what it's like to write software and then see it operate, especially in a real-world environment rather than just in a test lab. And there's a progression of joy related to the intelligence of the program. Does God have a progression of joy related to the intelligence of the program as it plays out, you know, between the pretty much hard-coded principles that atoms operate with versus a plant and its beauty and glory versus an animal versus you. He delights in you becoming what you were made to be, to freely flourish in a real-world environment. Kind of like what you feel as a teacher when a student gets an intelligence that's implanted into them or Maybe you feel it as a mentor when you're working with kids who work alongside and you put it into them and there's a delight that you feel when, when they grab onto it and, and it, it, it goes and evolves in them. Or like a mom would feel towards her children. Only all of those people are dealing with pre-installed software in the people that they're embedding that intelligence in. Imagine being the one who kind of put the intelligence there and the capacity there and the code there to begin with. To actually write the software out of nothing. I mean, that is out of this world. 
And it really is out of this world because even software engineers don't create out of nothing. Only God creates out of nothing. They use stuff that God gave them, logical constants, mathematical formulae, pre-existing languages, Java. And by utilizing all of that, they bring and give us all a better life. You think about how software and hardware and the whole computer age has improved our capacity to have life. So how can that then not be a gift from God so that humanity can flourish and fully be in terms of their intelligences becoming what God designed and coded our intelligences to be? Software helps us more fully image the God who made us to be more human. And yes, sometimes software people become godlike and think like they did in the 60s, you know, artificial intelligence, and they were pouring money in it like crazy, and within a few decades, we're going to be able to repl replicate the human mind and build a Tower of Babel, and we'll be able to do everything with computers, and then a decade or so realizing, oh my goodness, we can't do half of what a human mind can do. We, we can do calculus in a computer to very high levels, but we can't teach a computer to recognize its mother like a two-year-old kid can yet. Which makes me think, theologically, that all of your creating and mine is at once derivative. We're using God's stuff and two, finite. And it's between the space of those two things that we do our creating. So I asked this guy, Chuck Black, unpack what you feel when you're in the moment, in the zone, writing code, writing a program, what, what is going on in you as God's image bearer in that place? What does it feel like? And it took me six, five or six emails back and forth to finally get him to think into what he was feeling in that place. And he came back with two responses. First, it's an emotional and intellectual feeling of being proud at having created something that behaves and operates correctly under all sorts of conditions. And literally, as I'm reading those words, I'm imagining the heart of God feeling that toward you and me. It's an emotional and intellectual feeling of being proud at having created something that behaves and operates correctly under all sorts of conditions. Like, is God feeling that toward you now, toward me in my life? There's a way to being a human being and a grain to the universe. He's made you for His glory to be a human in, in, within these kind of pre-encoded Soft, lots of room for free will, yet somehow pre-designed and destined way. And is he feeling a programmer's delight toward the way that that is playing out in you, operating correctly under all sorts of conditions? He's written an intelligence into your heart and your very conscience, the Apostle Paul writes. The requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. And then the prophet Jeremiah, God saying, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Like, are you really being God's people? Or are there bugs? The second thing Chuck said he felt in writing programs was this. It is a paternal feeling, like a father for a son or a daughter, 
or when you see your offspring do something good or right, like doing well in school or athletics, or more importantly, making kind and gracious, gracious choices that show that they've learned what you've tried to teach them. Paul again writes, we are God's offspring. We are called to learn and live into what he's taught us, what he's encoded into us. We're called to respond to the making and the remaking of God's programming presence in our lives. Because each of our source codes is broken and falling short and has been hacked and is falling short of the designed by God, glory of God. But the gospel is that God the Father has sent a patch in Jesus Christ, a fix through the presence of Christ come to us in the Holy Spirit. The advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you everything I've programmed in to life. And the Spirit I have learned, that fix builds into, builds huge intelligence into a human life. I mean, you think you've got innate gifts that God's given you. To have those illumined and inflamed and empowered by the Spirit of God is to be transformed A direct line to the architect of everything that is, all of a sudden is yours and is feeding into the program that is your life. The God who creates all living things takes up residence in you and in me. I think that's where the deeper meaning lies for a software designer to create something of such a high intelligence that it takes on a life of its own. Only a love that is like the love of God would want such a freedom for another. He explained it this way, Chuck Black, when a poet or a songwriter or a soccer player do something well, the thing the thing they did reaches out and touches people. He's trying to draw the line between what's different with what he does and what other people do who create things. When a poet, a songwriter, or a soccer player do something well, the thing that they did reaches out and touches people in a somewhat magical way, in a numinous way. They kind of feel it and interact that way. It's something, fi it's something finite that is created or done and which then has an effect on all who see or hear or experience it. In the case of software, it's more like something is created which actually goes on living, in a sense, and continues interacting in a living way with the things around it. Like, God could have hard-coded you to believe and to obey, and instead He does this software thing in you so that you can freely choose to love Him back as the greatest act of love for you so that he can have the greatest joy in seeing you respond in that loving way back to him. And you go on living. And you go on living forever in our story, right? We're immortal beings made to engage the intelligence of God forever and to continue our image bearing beyond death on a new earth forever. Never quite plumbing the heart, the mind of God. Chuck's quote reminded me of Vincent van Gogh's. He wrote to a friend named Bernard these words. It's a very good thing that you read the Bible the Bible is Christ, for the Old Testament leads up to this culminating point. 
Christ alone, of all the philosophers, magi, etc., has affirmed as a principal certainty eternal life, the infinity of time, the nothingness of death, the necessity and the raison d'etre of serenity and devotion. He lived serenely as a greater artist than all other artists, despising marble and clay as well as color, working in living flesh. That is to say, this matchless artist, hardly to be, conce be conceived of by the obtuse instrument of our modern, nervous, stupefied brains, made neither statues, nor pictures, nor books. He loudly proclaimed that he made living men, immortals. Though this artist, this great artist, Christ, disdained writing books on ideas, what Van Gogh called sensations, he surely disdained the spoken word much less, particularly the parable. Your job, the world, creation, living parables. What a sower, what a harvest, what a fig tree, what a programmer, what a business person, what an artist, what a student, what a nurse, what a home care worker. What a beautiful life that disabled person is living. What a wonderful testimony to the glory of God is all that we do and all that we do collectively before God, a witness to his glory. What a sower, what a harvest, what a fig tree. These considerations, my dear Bernard, lead us very far, very far afield. They raise us above art and programming and all those things themselves. They make us see the art of creating life, the art of being immortal and alive at the same time. I think all creators and maybe programmers in their world-creating nature especially are like Jesus in this way. They're embodying the world-creating wisdom and intelligence of God, of Jesus Christ, the one through whom all things were made. Let's pray. So God, we are made to know you as we invest intelligence into our world and make culture and embed it with truth and wisdom as the God who does exactly that. When, when we find life doing those things as code monkeys, as, as auto mechanics, as people who work or study or do whatever we do, we are imaging you and that moment is meant to be a place through which, within which, we can experience you. A moment through which and in which we're often deaf and dumb and mute, slothful, uh, turning the other way, unaware, asleep. Wake us by your Holy Spirit so that we can see again, so that we can hear again, so that we can be alive to your presence in all things, all the time, in all ways. So that the glory that is only due your name as the maker of all things would come to you. So that you, Jesus, seated at the right hand of God, through whom and for whom all things were made. The one right now who holds together everything from Adam